True innovation changes the way we live. Let's take computers. We interact with dozens of them every day. But at first, we couldn't even engage these machines. Then along came the mouse. The mouse made it possible to point at things like we humans point at. But that was decades ago. So what's next? Have we reached a turning point? And who are the innovators taking us there? Meet Oblong. I think technology progress happens in waves, and there are moments where everything begins to shift. I think since the invention of the computer, people have been looking for something else. There had to be something more. There's so much more that people could be doing with machines. Anybody who talks about the next generation of computer interfaces feels compelled to mention Minority Report. Okay, Jad, what's coming? Red Bull, double homicide, one male, one female. Killers male, white, 40. Agatha nailed the time frame at 8.04 a.m. Steven Spielberg may have showcased what was possible in his 2002 feature film, Minority Report, but it was this man that made it a reality. John had identified a moment when we were going to shift from how we use computers today to how we will use computers tomorrow. And that future is in your hands, literally. Now we're saying that we don't want to go beyond the mouse. We've always wanted to. The mouse is so is such a sort of tiny little keyhole to, to push all of human expression through. It's called G-Speak. It's a spatial operating environment. That's a fancy way of saying I use my body as an interface to the computer. Basically, I'm the mouse. What we did was to take out all of the other objects, right? So what you're left with is human hands, which are the sort of most expressive, most interesting objects that we have available to us. Anything you point at will respond to you. You can pull it down to any screen you've got in the room. Out of all of the human gestures, point. it's the one that, one that draws a connection between your body, your intent, and some piece of distant space. If you're giving a presentation, you know, a PowerPoint presentation or something like that, and you wanted to be a little less linear about what you're doing, I just popped out. Mm -hmm. And I can go to some other application we have here, pop back into it. You can get kind of uh, fixated on what people do with their hands, and you can find yourself staring at hands in restaurants and airports and all over the place. The idea is that we're experts in operating in a physical 3D space. It consists of rooms and objects and other human beings and pets and plants and everything that's around us. So we've built up a lifetime of experience and we've evolved hundreds of millions of years of experience learning how to deal with that stuff. And the only thing that doesn't work that way is the computer. When you use a regular computer, even today, you still sort of subjugate yourself to, to its view of things. That is, you sit in front of it, you kind of hunch down, you get your hands on the keyboard, and you peer into its face. And you're scratching around with the mouse, this chunk of plastic. It's on a mouse pad, or it's on your desk, or wherever it is. Uh, it's at the end of your hand, and it has nothing to do spatially with the information you're interested in. So everything we do is truly 3D, truly spatial and then I can touch with my other hand to lock that selection. And now when I fly around, I'm looking at just these probes in the data set. I can come way in, I can toggle their coloration. If you want to be exact, I would assume the companies want to be exact, you're not going to be drawing something on there. You want that data to be there and then get into the data? I you know, it's a good question. No. You, you can be very precise with this interface. We're accurate to a pixel, How essentially accurate as accurate as a mouse. Though? We're pretty good at using our hands. We've been really? using them since we were really little and uh, we know very well in space where our hands are and what, what we're pointing at. So I can point at one of these things and select precise, very precisely one of them. And I can move it around in this grid, this data volume grid that it's all laid out in. The, the human hand is sort of the most complicated part of our bodies and by extension one of the most complicated and so, sort of sophisticated bits of the animal kingdom in general. You know, it doesn't bend in just one way. Each finger can, you know, bend sideways and laterally and you can, you know, configure it however you want. We've developed a, a language basically for expressing human gesture in compact code form. So our programmers, and I include myself gladly in that, uh, you know, use this, this compact notation to say, this is this hand gesture, this is this movement, and so forth. So that's a quick representation that you can use to uh, know what, your, what the system thinks your hands are doing. If you move your fingers, you see the characters left of the colon change. Uh, so we're, we're mapping your finger position, your, the angle of your finger, to 
each of those characters. Mm -hmm. And then if you rotate your whole hand, the characters to the right of the colon change. Mm -hmm. So that is a, uh, a quantized metric of the angle of your whole hand. Coding the human hand. For Oblong, it's the key to remaking the relationship between man and machine. Step a little bit. I think that sounds good. Can we let it run for a bit? We're in this for the big picture. We're, we're swinging for the fences here. We want everybody in the world to use our technology stack and our interface uh, on every computer. Now that's a tall order, but then again, this all took off in Hollywood. See, I can't out of time. Running out of time. Oh. Can you grab that? It's unclear. John made it to Hollywood. He was on the set of Minority Report for more than a year. Then there was the Hulk, I Am Legend, and even Iron Man. But wait, stop. Let's start at the beginning. I spent a lot of years at MIT, which was, um, you know, for a lot of those years, a kind of nerd nirvana. His professor remembers. John's a genius. When he writes computer programs, he writes them like poetry. They're actually fun to read, actually. Most people will say, you know, stick seven inside A, A equals seven, A, boring. John will say, this variable is used on a good day on a sunny side of Wednesday, equals four. Both worked at the MIT Media Lab, a place where, as they like to say, science and technology are connected to humanity. I'd observed as technology had advanced that something was missing, a kind of a, a human sensibility. This is what's been ignored all along. The idea that even the computer, even the pixels, even the information lives in the world with you. We're sort of all in it together. It was a luminous concept. It seemed that the biggest thing that was missing from the way people were thinking about interface in those days was space itself. I'll just reach in and scroll that if you don't mind. So John set out to change the rules of the game. Okay, so you started the, a bunch of research, you started getting ideas of this, mm -hmm. there, there has to be more than just the mouse. What is the Luminous Room at the MIT Media Lab? How did it come about? Well, the Luminous Room is sort of the grandmother of the stuff that you see here today, G-Speak, uh, our, our oblong spatial operating environment. And it was uh, a kind of grand conception that put the computer out in the room with you. Information would literally spill onto every floor, wall, ceiling, table surface, wherever you needed it. Uh, so the computer would, in, in essence, meet you halfway. It was that futuristic yet concrete reality that attracted Spielberg's production designer to the Luminous Room while on a shopping spree at the lab for Minority Report. To make the film work, as far as he was concerned, it had to be an absolutely believable, real 2054. And so it was very natural for him to reach out to places like MIT and, and other sites where pieces of future were being invented. Before he knew it, John was in L.A. teaching Tom Cruise himself the gestural language he'd created. Did you actually work with him? Did you show Tom we Cruise did. how to move his hands? Yeah, he's a, a quick study, <laughs> but there's that moment when you're showing people for the first time, and, uh, you know, you, there's some imagination involved. Sorry, Danny, I'm going to have to give you the full tour some other time. Now, what you see in Minority Report is all Hollywood smoke and mirrors. The technology still didn't actually exist as it does today, but an idea was cooking. John called up his MIT Media Lab buddy, Quindla Kramer, and proposed a business venture. We built it once in a school. We built it once uh, as a kind of highly polished Hollywood exercise. And it was just so natural for us as engineers to go back and build it a third time, but build it for real this time. Build it as a commercial product. Quinn had spent the last six years working in Africa, building content distribution systems for news from the region. After a year of thinking about it, Quinn decided he was ready to get his hands dirty. Oblong was born. What made you decide, okay, you know what? I believe in John, I wanna do this with him. How did he propose a partnership? We took our time to decide which path was the right one and ultimately decided that if we really wanted to build technology that everybody in the world used, if we wanted to make this, this, uh, this change happen from the era dominated by the mouse to a new era where we can point at every screen in the world, we had to have the kind of growth potential and the structure that comes only with a startup company. But the duo were in a much better position 
than your typical startup. So we had revenues, we had a business plan, we had a we had working technology. So we pitched carefully to lots and lots of venture capitalists. The space age venture landed in Boulder, Colorado, at the Foundry Group. We're a pretty eclectic bunch of a uh, bunch of guys in a in a fairly uh, eclectic investment portfolio as well. The venture capital firm invests in early stage software companies with long time horizons. Ten years ago, the venture funds probably expected to return their investment in three to five. We never have. We're not in a rush. Uh, you know, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years, whatever it takes. We're going to be with the entrepreneur to, to help them hopefully achieve something uh, special. While most venture capital funds invest in certain sectors, the Foundry Group takes a different view. It invests by theme, and one of its key interests is human-computer interaction. So we went in and saw them, and it was one of those wow moments. And it was just like, this is huge. This is, this is the next big thing. This is what's going to define how humans interact with computers for you know, the rest of my lifetime, hopefully. The firm made a Series A investment in Oblong that was close to $10 million. The men behind the idea sealed the deal. The first thing you have to fall in love with before the idea is that team. That's when you get the stars in the eye and you walk away from the first meeting and it's like the best first date you've ever had. You can't wait till you get to see them again. Venture capital is kind of an interesting mix uh, to me between um, you know, things that are very analytic and quantitative and things that are very qualitative. And music actually fits that pretty well, right? It's a combination of, it's, it's very mathematical, there's all the rules around music, but then uh, playing and improvisation and whatnot is, is, is very creative. It's a philosophy, an intersection between math and art that Oblong understands well. We believe strongly here at Oblong that, that we've just passed the last point in technology history where technology can be developed alone. This train of thought led John to partner up with his old MIT professor, John Maida. Maida is now the president of the Rhode Island School of Design. Oblong gave RISD a working G-Speak system with one mandate, find new ways to use it. He could easily leave it. I can fly around by pushing in and out. And that's using right, these two fingers here. That's exactly now right, so now you're flying. I'm flying. Oblong certainly is. Just three years in, the startup has multi-million dollar backing by a VC firm, projects in half a dozen countries, and some very big clients. They've got customers that are out there. This isn't a, a science or a lab. I mean, this is real technology that's being used by real people out there. And we're talking real money. In fact, a typical Oblong contract with an early adopter client ranges from two to ten million dollars. We work closely with a handful of, of, of companies, groups within companies who have big problems that they can't solve with today's computers. Quinn holds his high-profile niche customer list close to his chest, but just who exactly is Oblong working with and what is it doing? If this next example is any indication, the sky's the limit. What we're trying to do with the Oblong platform is better enable human beings to do what they do best, drive insight. This turns out to be a really natural way to get around 2D and 3D data sets, big images, large layouts of data. How does this play into practical application with the companies that you guys are working so with? So we have a number of clients who have really huge data sets that are either literally spatial, so they're maps and, and 3D worldviews, and they need to get around them much more effectively than they can with a mouse or a joystick or a keyboard. Oblong has also confirmed it was involved in research on something much closer to its sci-fi roots. In September, Boeing filed a patent application for a system and method of controlling a swarm of unmanned vehicles using body motions. Boeing says Oblong sealed the deal because it uses open source tools. In other words, it's easily integrated into big corporate IT cultures. If you're trying to get something into a large amount of people's hands, it's got to be open. First, it's getting better insight out of the data you currently have in your current processes. 
but later it becomes redefining those processes in entirely new productive ways. That to me is innovation, that to me is in enabling growth, if not the growth itself. Oblong is determined to grow at every level. We're releasing products in 2010 that will be much more affordable and accessible than the very high-end systems we sell right now. We'll cut that number from hundreds of thousands of dollars by a factor of 10 next year. What's your growth estimate for 2010? Oh, I think we'll increase our current revenues by, by a factor of 10 as we cut the pricing by a factor of 10. Some of those affordable systems include corporate conference room products and workstations. We focused on the development of products for corporate conference rooms, partly because there's such a, a very strong drive in, in both US and European corporate cultures to reduce travel costs. The conference room space is an area that has seen increased competition in the last year, but Quinn isn't worried. He says this will only launch their product into the mainstream. The secret's out of the bag, kind of about this idea of spatial operating oh, sure. systems. Yeah. And you guys kept it quiet for a while as you build the company, but there's got to be new competitors coming out of the woodworks at this point. What does that environment look like? You know, that's a great question. We, we, we hope for competitors because it means we'll have achieved, I think, a certain uh, you know, level of communication of, of our ideas and a, a certain validation of the technology we're building. We don't currently have competitors. There's no one else who offers spatial computing. There's no platform you can buy other than from us that lets you point at any screen in the world and interact with any computer through that screen on the network. I'm sure that's coming, but it hasn't come yet. Hollywood. It's a place where stories... That... on the network. Hollywood. It's a place where stories are taken and magnified to a large scale. These hills, that sign, they're not much, but they represent something much bigger. Now, Oblong may have started here with Minority Report, but it wants the exact same thing, to represent something massive. Building new tools, building new technologies that people use, that's, that's really addictive. It didn't seem worth doing a startup unless we sort of grab the biggest chunk of future that we could imagine at the time. Big, vast, that's about the only way to describe what Quinn and John are trying to do. We're not interested in incremental achievements. Incremental achievements are important from a business perspective, but from a technology perspective, we're looking for the whole thing. We want to be a core technology provider. We want, we want everyone who writes software to think that the software basis we have to offer them is the most exciting thing they could be using to build their applications. The potential of G-Speak is endless. My expectation is that they're going to redefine how we work with computers for the rest of our life. That's a very tall order to change the way the world uses computers. What makes you think you guys can do it? First, it needs to happen. We're, we're kind of up against the wall of what current user interfaces, current computational systems, and even the way people think about writing programs can continue to expand to serve what people want. So there's that need. We think that what's going to drive the solution to that need is a new conception about that very sort of intimate moment of interface between humans and machines. And they're improving upon that intimacy. In fact, just last month, the team tried the platform without gloves. And that means that anytime you as a human being walk up to any screen, uh, whether it's a TV screen in your living room or a computer or a laptop uh, or a large, you know, building sized display out in Times Square or Yinza, you'll be able to interact directly with it using your hands, pointing, gesturing and so forth. Can you imagine, maybe I could take this screen right here and put it over there. I think the two things that excite me most about Oblon right now are obviously the Not Gloves project as they're calling it internally. So that's a very uh, interesting project. And I think the other thing that's great is I'm really looking forward to seeing how they can truly bring collaboration to the workplace. So we're standing on the shoulders of the giants who've come before. We look at the development of the original Apple Macintosh as a real touchstone. And the original Macintosh team built their computer from the ground up. They designed the hardware and the operating system and all of the applications to work in a new and really exciting way. We're trying to do something that's a little bit similar to that. We're trying to provide a full platform that allows people to use a computer in a very new way. There's no reason it, it couldn't be as big as an Apple or a Microsoft one day. 
Some of the greatest innovations across many, many disciplines are those that sneak a strange, unexpected kind of generosity in along with their success. So we're fundamentally trying to build a different kind of technology that is more humanistic, that breaks apart the standard assumption that it's one person and one computer. Our systems are inherently collaborative. And that seems somehow like it really changes the, the rules of the game. So will these two change the way we interact with computers? Is this the future? Oblong could very well be taking us to that turning point. I'm Chris Valerio. Thanks for watching.